EGCE Research Bites, student teacher research from the team behind Emma and Tom Talk Teaching. Hello and welcome to PGCE Research Bites. And today I've got Christy Scott talking to me about her second assignment on the PGC uh, primary programme. So tell us a little bit, uh, what was the focus of this assignment for you? Yeah, so thank you for having me here today. And my second assignment, I focused on how you can use game-based learning in mathematics to promote students' um, academic achievements and their attitudes towards maths in general. And tell us a little bit, before you tell us about the actual research itself, about the context of the school where this was happening. Yes, so my second placement was at my lead partnership school, which is at a lovely school in North Cardiff. And it's also one of the schools that was a pioneer school for the new Welsh curriculum. And they are fantastic at what they do. They had a recent Eston visit who just praised them on their creativity and their Um, innovative and blended learning approaches and so I knew when I was at the school I had a great opportunity to learn a lot Um, but my mentor was also very supportive in allowing me to implement different interventions and ideas to try different ways of teaching and learning. And you were which, which class? I was in a year four class and that class was pretty unique because there was a very wide range of academic abilities and we often address this through chili challenges where we had the mild spicy hot but in maths especially there was a really wide gap and a lot of a lack of foundational maths knowledge which made it really difficult for students to progress in their learning. And in your assignment you suggest that this may possibly be down to COVID. Yes well when I was talking to my mentor about which area um, she'd like me to focus on for the assignment she mentioned spelling and maths. And um, when it came to spelling, it was about the lack of phonics skills. And when we talk about maths, we notice there is a lot of that foundational knowledge missing. And at the school, um, the Essen report had mentioned that in years one and two, they were really fantastic at implementing opportunities to um, work outside and to create um, blended outdoor learning experiences mm-hmm. that really helped students to consolidate their knowledge of early math skills. And since the students are in year four now, they missed out on those opportunities, which are crucial in years one and two to um, learn foundational math skills, like those 10 bonds and their early multiplication skills. And they were online learning, which you can lose a lot of really important knowledge by doing that. So why did you land on game-based learning specifically to address this problem, therefore? Yeah, well... Um, Since the Essen reports had praised the creativity in this school, I thought I wanted to do something that was innovative and engaging. And also, since the students had missed out on those early years where there's a lot of play-based learning and they talked about outdoor learning experiences, I wanted to implement that engaging way. So I took a bit of a reverse approach where I looked at my own experiences and something I knew that worked and my um, my own role models in teaching Um, My mom, in particular, she was the queen of implementing games in her teaching, and it worked. And I didn't know the evidence of why it worked or how it worked or how you could quantify what was happening. But I knew that doing games in a classroom is a really fun way to help Mm. students learn. And so that inspired me to do some research and inquiry Mm. and really look at how is it working and why is it working Um, And will it help them improve their maths? Mm -hmm. So you turned to the literature, and I think you were influenced quite heavily by certain people um, in in your review of literature. Tell us a little bit more what what you learned. Yes, well, in my review of literature, I looked at game-based learning in three main categories. So I wanted to look at first how it affects maths anxiety. I wanted to look at how it impacted academic performance and also what game-based learning, um, how it influenced students' motivation for learning. And so in maths anxiety, that's where it really starts because the pupils that were struggling the most and the pupils that I targeted for my intervention were the lowest attaining pupils. And they're the ones that they were even struggling with the mild chili challenges. They were lacking those um, early multiplication skills, knowing how to do 10 bonds, just struggling in general. And so I noticed that in maths, they didn't feel very confident or excited about it. 
And there is something that is widely um, noticed in research called maths anxiety. Mm. So it's that feeling of fear or apprehension whenever you're talking about maths. And mm. some people have that mm. right away. You mentioned maths and they shut down. And a lot of students who are having trouble um, succeeding in maths, they experience maths anxiety. Um, and so there was a few um, different articles I looked at. There was mm. one survey by Cambridge in 2019, and they considered the UK in a maths crisis because so many students and adults are impacted by maths anxiety, mm. and that deters them later in life and in secondary from pursuing maths mm. as um, a profession or just for further pursuing it in their academic career. And they found that there's a bi-directional relationship between maths anxiety and maths performance. So that means mm. if you have maths anxiety, you're more likely to struggle with your maths performance. Mm. But also the other way that if you are not performing well in maths, you're going to have that maths anxiety as well. And so I thought it was interesting to look into kind of the physiological side of, mm. well, why, why do people have maths anxiety? And it's actually, it comes down to a biological reaction where you have, um, if you have maths anxiety, you have this neural threat response in your body. And so your sympathetic nervous system can actually shut down when it hears math. It's shutting down. It's having this fight or flight response. Um, and it's really difficult to succeed when you're experiencing mm. that. But on the opposite side, to counteract it with game-based learning, on a physiological side, when you are engaging in play and these games and you're in a social environment, you are releasing these endorphins, which actually make you feel calm and focused. And there's this part of our brain called the hippocampus, and it's um, it's responsible for creating these long-term memories. And you can activate it by um, having this like fun experience. You are creating um, this positive association between the information you're learning and having fun and that allows you to activate that long-term storage in your hippocampus brain so you get to um, consolidate those memories for a longer period of time which can be really helpful so if you have maths anxiety and you're feeling this response by doing games you're helping to calm the body and help access that memory and storage so you can use your brain um, more effectively than just being in this um, scared state so I, I thought that was interesting and I thought that made sense of why people are experiencing that anxiety, how can game-based learning help them? Um, and then I wanted to look next at, okay, how is that actually helping their academic performance? Mm -hmm. There was some literature that was skeptical that maybe games, it's just kind of fun. They're not actually learning anything. It's just a waste of time from actually learning the hard content. But in a lot of research, they did find that game-based learning is practicing essential um, strategy skills and learning how to solve problems. And in the Welsh curriculum, one of the four purposes is that you're creating these ambitious, capable learners that are able to um, solve problems and they're keen to um, take on new challenges and to set high standards for themselves. And so that relates a lot to game-based learning because you are seeking these challenges, you're overcoming them um, in creative ways. And there was quite a few um, quite a few different studies, but I was also drawn to some that talked about how digital game-based learning can improve academic performance as well. And a lot of it comes down to um, motivation to do it and also the instantaneous feedback you get from it. So a lot of students, if you mention technology, they're very excited to use it. And so that is that motivation of, okay, I want to play um, these games, I want to practice, I'm going to get better. But you also have the opportunity to get the feedback right away when it's digital. It tells you, yep, that's right. Nope, that's wrong. So they can self-correct themselves and work on that. And it also can be personalized where a lot of the time if you're doing um, a digital game, it has that technology where you can um, choose different levels depending on where the student's at. So that can be a really great way for students to practice. Um, and a lot of uh, studies did find that it did improve their academic performance. Um, and it also then can relate to the digital competency framework, which is in the Welsh curriculum. So it's a great way to practice both of those things. Um, and then lastly, I looked at the motivation that students had when they had game-based learning. So in my own studies or my own research, I noticed that the students weren't really motivated to even try when they weren't um, feeling like they were good at math. And when I was doing my intervention, I noticed there were comments where students just said, I feel like I'm behind. I feel like I don't, it's too hard for me. So I wanted to look at, okay, how 
does the game-based learning, how does math anxiety, how does performance all relate to their motivation? And overall, it was found that there is a positive feedback loop between game-based learning and um, increased achievement and excitement. So students feel more motivated to play the games because they're excited to play games. It's fun. It's social. It's a natural, I think, human um, thing to enjoy playing games with your friends. Um, and then as you're practicing more, you're achieving more. So you're getting more excited. You want to do better. And I related this actually to Maslow's hierarchy where you have your different needs and you have your basic needs where you need your like food and shelter and your water and your safety and you have psychological needs but at the very top of the tier it's your um, self-actualization and so it's self-fulfillment of you are intrinsically motivated to be your best self and to do the best yourself to reach your full potential so if students are engaging in these games they want to do well and if they're having fun they want to keep um, they're intrinsically motivated to keep trying to get better. It's just that if they have that math anxiety, it might hold them back um, when they're not getting those results they want. So it's about supporting students and implementing different ways of learning, like game-based learning, that will motivate them. Oh, I can do it. I want to be my best self. I'm going to keep practicing. Um, so I thought that was a neat way to look at it. And it also, game-based learning study showed that for um, additional learning needs environments, it can be really helpful um, with digital learning or with just games in general that it provides an opportunity for students to learn in a hands-on way. It can be personalized to their needs and differentiated for what they need. I mean, it's a unique way to learn um, and really effective in ALN environments. Mm. Um, what I noticed in particular in your assignment, you related all of this, and, and this provided the perfect rationale, really, didn't it, for why you should be using game-based learning to support the children. But you related it all to the Welsh curriculum on a regular basis, but also you related it to the needs of the children in your class. You'd identified that need, and it seemed to me that the literature was supporting the argument for using game-based learning to, to address this. So then, just before we go on to talk about the actual intervention, mm -hmm. um, you did do this with the whole of the class. You did follow BIRA guidelines. You were very careful about doing an intervention with everybody, but you focused your results, didn't you, on particular children? I did. And so in order to protect the students that I was um, targeting in this intervention, I delivered it to the entire class. So it wasn't like anyone was ostracized or they felt mm. like they were being pulled away from anything. It was something we all did together, but I collected and focused the results on five pupils in particular. And those five pupils, I chose them based on, I looked at the MALT testing and literacy testing scores, which in both cases, students were at the very bottom, which when we're talking about, um, their confidence in school and their in, um, engagement and motivation to do well, their self-fulfillment. When you are at the very bottom of your peers in both literacy and math and academics, you might you might feel not great about things and not feel extremely motivated. Um, so I chose some of those, I chose five people who were in that category. There was also um, two out of the five were eligible for free school meals, which in the entire class, only three students were. So when you're talking about 10% of the entire class is eligible for free school meals and 40% of the students in my targeted intervention are. It gives me a little bit more context of just different backgrounds. Um, and so, yeah, those were the students I targeted. I only um, collected their information and I followed your guidelines just because since they're in a vulnerable position, position and I'm asking them about their attitudes towards math, how they're feeling, I just want to make sure that they're protected um, against anything unethical if they're to disclose anything or share anything about why they're feeling a certain way. And in the sample as well, you had some girls and some boys mm -hmm. because the literature had suggested there was some correlation there as well, wasn't there? Yes, there is. So um, the UK Department of Education, their 2019 survey where they had said that maths is identified as the most disliked subject in the UK. They also said that girls are more vulnerable to um, disliking the subject and that many girls are deterred away from pursuing maths because of stereotypes and biases that they have, which for me, that breaks my heart because mm. I am someone who I did my undergrad in life sciences and I have my um, bachelor's degree of science. And so 
I'm really passionate about having women in STEM and pursuing different careers. And so in my, I thought it was interesting that the literature supported that still in this time period, women and girls are impacted by this. Mm -hmm. But in my sample, I had um, three girls and two boys. And it, um, yeah, the, um, it shows that there is a difference and that the girls mostly said that they did not like it, where the boys, although their scores were lower, they did say that they still enjoyed the subject. Yeah, yeah. well, that's interesting in itself. It like, is. That's another study again, <laughs> in, in a way. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the intervention, because this was sort of a staged process as well, wasn't it? It is. So um, I was lucky that my mentor, as soon as I started my clinical practice, she said, let's start talking about this assignment. And we were talking about things I had time to research. Um, and then when it came to actually implementing my intervention, I knew I wanted to do a pretest, three, um, three periods of actually doing the intervention, and then a post-test to see my results. And so I chose the, a game, a maths game, and it was a really simple game. I saw it online, and then I tracked the original source to uh, Australian Department of Education. There's a simple game with lolly sticks where students draw a stick, it has a multiplication question on it and they answer it and then they keep going until they pull a stick that says kaboom on it and there was a few random kabooms in there if they got kaboom they had to put all their sticks back it's very simple but the students absolutely loved it and it's that repetition of they're practicing those facts over and over and i was strategic about which fact families i gave the students so i mentioned that the students that i targeted were achieving below and because they were lacking a lot of foundational skills so I looked at the maths curriculum progression steps, and in the one progression step for maths, in um, progression step two, it said that students should be fluent in their multiplication families of two, three, four, five, and ten. So that's five families, and I knew confidently that the students I was targeting, they were not fluent. Mm. And it's that idea of a spiral curriculum that if these students don't have fluency in those five um, families, how are they then going to progress to doing all 10 of their multiplication mm. families or to do um, factors or to do um, division, all these different things that they need to build on those skills, they need to have those down. So I focused the um, questions asked in the multiplication game for those five multiplication families and I delivered it um, three times and they got to play and students really enjoyed. They got into the routine where they knew when they came in, that's what they were going to play. They had fun. They were communicating with their peers. It was a very social game, which if we're thinking about Vygotsky's social learning theory, um, children can really benefit from being in a social environment and health and well-being. It's important that they can communicate with their peers and learn how to play games respectfully and be competitive in a respectful way. Um, but back to my intervention, I decided on the framework, I decided on the game, but I needed to decide how I was going to quantify my results. And with that, I chose pre and post testing. And in my pretest, I used a multiplication grid. So it's very simple. On the X axis, it had the numbers one to 10. And on the Y, it had that um, the two, three, four, five, and 10 families that I had chosen. And then there was also an attitude scale. So I wanted to look at achievement. So could they actually get the families right? but also how did they feel about it? So the attitude scale I used was called a Likert attitude scale, and it's commonly used. It's something that I think at the university we use often when we're talking about it. Um, but a Likert scale is when you see where it says strongly disagree, neutral, strongly agree, or something in that sense. And in my questionnaire, I used little emojis that had frowny faces and neutral um, and happy faces. And the first question was, how did you feel about today's maths lesson? And then they chose which um, face both... Um, correlated to how they felt that day. And then I had another one that said, how do you feel about maths in general? And when um, I did that at the beginning, we did the three um, lots of actually practicing the game. And then I did the exact same test at the end as a post test. And that gave me the data that afterwards I could compare how did they start? How did they finish? And what was the impact of the intervention? Mm -hmm. But you also adapted the intervention, didn't you, mm -hmm. to include some um, peer assessment and things as well. But, so what influenced your decisions to adapt the intervention as you were going along? Yeah, so I noticed the first time that I did my intervention, the pupils were having loads of fun drawing the sticks and doing everything, um, playing with each other. But because I was targeting pupils that were struggling um, to get these questions right, 
when they didn't have the answers in front of them, they weren't able to self-correct each other or themselves. So they were practicing saying the question, but they didn't actually have um, this validation of, was that right? Mm -hmm. And there's no sense in practicing fluency in in math if you're not practicing the right Mm -hmm. answers. Mm -hmm. So that's where I had to adapt the game and add in a piece of peer assessment. And that's where I printed out a filled out grid, similar to the one that they had done in their pretest, but I have the answers in it. And now the job was you are peer assessing. So when your partner in your group is pulling a popsicle stick, your job is to now look at the grid and find the answer and self assess did they get it right? If they got it right, then you can give them a thumbs up. Great, keep going. But if they didn't get it right, it's your job. Now you're peer assessing. You need to give them feedback and let them have another go to see if they can get that one right. And that was then successful because mm-hmm. it was allowing them mm-hmm. to actually practice the right skills um, or the right answers. And it was adding in that piece of peer assessment, which I think at a year four level, it's really important that students are learning how can they respectfully peer assess each other and um, self-reflect and um fix their own answers when they're given feedback. Mm. So it's good, isn't it, to adapt and amend an intervention because you're still, you're analysing, you're observing, um, the learning, and you're making those adaptations as you go along, uh, which is what all good interventions should be. So then, in conclusion, from the data that you gathered uh, specifically about these five pupils, what conclusions did you come to? So I was quite pleased with my results, I could see in my pre and post test that there was an increase in first accuracy. And mm. so some people that had only gotten one question right before, um, they were now filling out like all of their two timetables or all of their 10 timetables. So they were able to, um, to learn a few more fact families. Mm. And I also saw an increase in their attitudes and um, in their um, attitude towards math in general and the lesson. I'm just looking, I have some of my results here with me where I had students, the mean score at the pretest was 15.2% accuracy and the mean at the end was 33.2% accuracy. So that is an increase. Mm. Attitudes towards um, the lesson in general were 1.8 in general um, in the first lesson and then moved up to 2.8. And I quantified that by using if you disliked the session and put the brownie face, that was a one. If you were neutral, that was a two. And if you were happy about it, that was a three. So 1.8 is just getting just below kind of neutral. And it moved up to a 2.8, which that's almost Mm -hmm. fully happy, which is great. Um, And then maths in general, which moved from a 2.4 to 2.8, not a huge change. And so my results did show that there was an increase, but I was a bit skeptical about the statistical significance of my results. Um, And that's where I critiqued it a bit further by doing a paired t-test analysis Mm -hmm. and in that test um, I was measuring the befores and the after and the impact and that test showed that there wasn't actually statistical significance to support that this was um, a meaningful um, change and that some of the changes seen there like there's still a lot of confounding variables that could have impacted my results. But doing that test allowed me to say, okay, I did see some improvement, but I do need to challenge this that it maybe isn't completely valid. I need to think about what outside factors um, impacted it. And then how can I adjust that to make it stronger in the future? So it's ongoing in a way, isn't it? So you you put the intervention in place, then you adapted it as you were going along, then you came to conclusions, but then you were challenging those, mm-hmm. which would mean slight change in practice again. Yes. So how has this all influenced your um, your own professional development, do you think? You know, what impact has actually doing this intervention had on your own professional learning? Yeah, there was a few different things. I guess I'll start first by when I had my um, attitudes assessment where students were saying how they felt. There was also a little line where it said, anything else you want to tell me about maths? And I was quite surprised some students had put, um, I'm feeling like I'm really behind and I'm feeling like it's too hard for me. I don't even want to try. And hearing those comments from the students, it broke my heart. But I realized this, giving them this assessment gave them that opportunity to share it with me. And I wouldn't have otherwise known that as an educator. So it's really important that when we're working with students, we're giving them opportunities to use their voice and to share their feelings with us about how they feel because once I learned that I was able to figure out okay how can I work with you mm-hmm. how can my mentor like how can we work together to make to change how you're feeling about this so 
providing opportunities for self-reflection, both for me and my students, I think is something I'll adopt in the future. And also, um, I think that in general, play is so important. And when I was thinking about an intervention to do in year four, and I thought about games, I was a bit worried that my students would find it too childish or they would just think it was silly. But it really showed they loved playing it and they often asked me even once the intervention was over, can we play Kaboom? Can we do it? Um, so I think that reminded me that these students are still children and play is so important. And that isn't just backed by my own thoughts. There's researchers from far beyond me that um, support that play is important. I think I quoted Plato in my assignment and he had said that the most important education is that children should play amongst lovely things. And I thought that was really important to keep in mind that um, in math, it's, you can have all of your um, like didactic teaching strategies, but incorporate some play as well. It's really important. So that's something I'll keep in mind moving forward. And in a way, you've verbalized there your own philosophy about learning yeah. and teaching, haven't you? Yes. Getting to know the child and incorporating play. So I, am I right in saying that that is your philosophy, your own personal philosophy about teaching and learning? It is. I think that incorporating play in something that my school did really well was incorporating these authentic learning experiences, incorporating blended experiences. I think that those are the best ways for students to um to engage with their learning, to be motivated to learn, and to learn life skills that aren't just applicable to getting the question correct on paper, but to applying these skills in a wider context of life. So we've come back full circle, really, to where you were talking about at the beginning about the values um, that the Eston Report had recognised in your school. Yeah. Um, so your own philosophy was very much aligned with your placement yes. therefore I think I learned loads from that placement and that influence doing um, so in, by working at that placement and by doing this intervention my philosophy was greatly influenced and so I definitely think that incorporating a play approach whether you're in reception which is where I was in my first placement where there's lots of play all the way through into you in year four or even year six um, is really important lovely thank you very much for your time today no problem thank you so much for having me